Ah. Wow. It's been a while for me to see everybody. <laughs> Some of you I saw at the retreat we just did. Yay. Wow. Ah. Yay. <laughs> take the time, take your time to say, you know, look at the other um, people at the other pages. I'm back at our quilt. Huh. Wow. I must say that I find this so wonderful. Yay. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you all. Oh, Ruth. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Wow. Well, Kay has offered to host us today. And so thank you, Kay, so much. It's good to see you. And um, Steve and I just got back from British Columbia, uh, Cortez Island, teaching a two week retreat. Um, so we're still a bit in the jet lag world, but that's a good place to teach mindfulness from. <laughs> as it is yeah because most of us are in jet lag all the time so it's a great <laughs> it's a great teaching tool <laughs> okay wow i'm happy to see all of you The last time I was looking at the screen like this, everybody was wearing, almost everybody was wearing winter clothes. So it's very different. Well, we were supposed to be in spring. Pardon? We were supposed to be in spring where we yes. were. Yes, right, yeah. <laughs> it just didn't turn out to be spring. <laughs> No. <laughs> cool. Very. So, Steve, um, I guess we're all here as best that I can see. Yeah. Go ahead. Mute myself. Am I muted? Take a few breaths and feel the effects. Of an inhalation and a pause and an exhalation and a pause. Just to get the full breath in the body. <clears throat> And see where attention naturally inclines. The whole body, your hands and feet, movement of the sensations of breathing. <clears throat> A little mindfulness dance between sense doors, light at the eyes, sound at the ears, sensation, you wash awareness through the body. 
Just so it feels grounding, natural, connected. And just notice how all the bodily formations begin to settle, begin to relax. And all the mental formations, thoughts, mental states, emotions, Until the whole system feels like it's letting go, letting be. Remember, the aim of meditation is noticing the calming when there's a consistency of mindfulness following the body sensations or the breath. All the effect of that brings about calm. Also to see unique natures as they appear. Sensations we don't ordinarily notice come up to the fore. Like we put a frame on them, magnify them a little bit, even for that nano moment of awareness. You see it's unique. Heat or pressure or energy. You see its courage or wavering between courage and fear or confidence. and doubt, energy, and the lack thereof, bright mind, not so bright, or bright mind, not so bright body, whatever is there, just noticing it, not trying to change it or fix it. It's fine to experiment a, a bit with balances, like if you notice an area in the body where there seems to be a lot of pressure, just out of interest, curiosity. Notice an area in the body where there isn't a lot of pressure. Same with soft or hard or cool and warm. Tension, relaxation. how different it can be in this one body, various areas of exploration. And we can do the same in the map of the mind. 
mental states and emotions. There'll be some fuzzy and hazy and some sharp and clear and some tending toward the negative end of the spectrum and some high energy and uplifting. It's like we're leaning back and watching the beginning of a movie, not changing the script or stopping anything. Once in a while, turning awareness back on itself.
Steve, can you turn your original sound on and bring it again? Turn it on? Yeah. I'm talking a lot about sound today, so I thought it would be nice to hear it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. The first, the first truth of existence that the Buddha taught was anicca, change, the truth of change that all conditioned things will take birth, that take birth will pass away with the very microscopic moments of time, moment by moment, uh, the change that's happening at our six sense doors, moment by moment. Um, and just like seasons or a lifetime of a body or a planet, a universe, like the, there's all these different ways we can um, come to appreciate or understand change. And I think there's an aspect of change that the Buddha taught, uh, the second foundation of mindfulness about Vedana that um, is often harder for us to see, especially if we're not taught about it well, but the, it's, a, it's a mental feeling. So the first foundation of mindfulness is awareness of kaya, of any aspect of our body. And the second is um, awareness of these mental feelings that is described as like a stream of change. So I like that it's described as like a watery, it's, it's fluid. There's a, with each moment of consciousness, there's a pleasant, unpleasant or neutral feeling that's <clears throat> just flowing along. It's very fast. Like right now, there's a sound of a rooster, there's a sound of wind, there's the sensations at the bottom of my feet, I can hear my voice. There's so much change going on. Uh, and um, we can often be aware of, of the sounds or the body sensations or thoughts or emotions, but also with each thought or each emotion or each um, sound or whatever's appearing at the six sense doors, there's a pleasant unpleasant or neutral feeling and it's changing moment by moment. So it's um, simultaneously with a sound, there's a pleasant, unpleasant or neutral mental feeling with it or simultaneously with a thought, there's a pleasant, unpleasant or neutral feeling, etc. and passing away. So there, this is very, very, um, this world of <laughs> anicca or change that we're born into and live through uh, is, is very vast. So there, I think there's a way in which our training doesn't help us to grasp um, why we're so uncomfortable with uncertainty or the insecurity of ins uncertainty, it's often the kind of level to which we have not been trained to 
how to work with, for example, the pleasant, the pleasant passing, just that, that pleasant passes or that pain arises or that there's neutral feelings and that there, most of this, almost all of this is out of our control. So there's the uncontrollability of it. This, the level to which we're not taught about it or know how to work with it, it requires, I think, an immense amount of compassion. Just, just, just that incredible compassion for all of us beings that are born into this, and then we don't, we don't get taught about it, right? We, we, we don't learn that we can have compassion for just that, that we can care about it, the pain of it, the pain of it, the uncontrollability of it. When um, Steve's mom turned 90 years old, she um, fell in the bathtub. Uh, and fortunately, Steve got a rare visa into Burma at that time where I was, I, I, my suitcase was packed. <laughs> I was about to go. And then I, I'd felt better to me that um, for both of Steve and I that I would stay. And um, Steve, Steve kind of took the stuff that he could use out of my suitcase and left for Burma. Um, and his mom was, I think she was unconscious for maybe 30 days about, but the, um, I can't remember exactly, but her, her doctor that we know well in the Sangha, she reassured me that she would wake up. So I knew that his mom really liked um, for her whole working life. And after she loved having a little cup of coffee when she woke up and she, she used to get up very early in the, very early in the dark before it would get light. And, and she'd go outside, she'd make the coffee, go outside and get the newspaper and drink her coffee and read the newspaper. That was a very, you know, lifelong uh, routine. So at 90, you know, you're kind of used to that. I think at that point. And um, so every morning I would have her coffee ready and the newspaper ready just in case she woke up in the hospital. So this day she woke up, I remember it so clearly, like it was yesterday and the headline of the newspaper, which I hadn't even looked at, <laughs> was um, the, the war in Iraq had started and she had taken a sip of coffee and she looked at the newspaper and she put it down on her lap and she was very quiet for a while. She looked at me and she said, I really don't think I wanna live through another war. And it was so powerful, like, um, because she wasn't saying, really, I don't want to live at all. And in fact, she really was very grateful and happy she was alive. But that sense of like, uh, how I'm 90, there's been so many. How can I live through this again? And I know she, she would and she could. And very strong. Um, but I think that as you get older, there's a weariness with certain kinds of pain in this world um, that we, we try so hard to um, do our best to bring care and compassion and change, good change and wisdom. And there's, there's a lot that isn't in our uh, ability to influence as much as we would like. But after that point in time, I felt like his mom and I had many more interesting discussions about 
being peaceful and the, the possibility of, of bringing more and more peace into this world and that what Steve and I were trying to do in this world. And um, it kind of cracked open something that I felt was actually really good, that, that kind of weariness. Um, and also seeing like the, the transforming of it to a, a deeper intention. Like a, I think I feel at this point in time, almost a fierceness about peace. It's like a fierceness of commitment in the face of how, the, how some aspects of the world are. Of course, there are many wonderful, beautiful aspects of life and many pleasant things. And I think that... Um, in this last retreat, Steve and I just taught, it just became so much more <laughs> clearer than ever just how important the Brahma Viharas are. The, the commitment, like I, to me, the commitment when I wake up each day to practice metta, e even if it's for a few seconds before I jump up and might have to do something just maybe not, maybe I can stay in bed for an hour and do my practice, but it's like that sense of, oh, okay, like that deeper commitment to, for that unconditional metta. And I, I, I guess I, I think back uh, on um, a teacher, the happy Sayadaw, a lot, um, maybe during my retreat that I had the joyful opportunity to get to do. And he, the way that he explained how to practice loving kindness, and I, I think of it when I wake up because he, he jumped up from his seat and he started touching his body like, and it's like his hands were unconditional love and just saying, no, no, you do metta. Metta is like this. It's not, it's like if your awareness of metta is like your hand, the unconditional love. He was saying, feel it for your body like this. And how many of us were taught to wake up like that? And I re I'm really meaning this. It's like the, the difference in the level of disconnect and like going to be busy and do things versus like, wait a minute, I'm not going to get up until I actually try to do this for my body. Now that can take five seconds or 10 seconds or longer, but it shifts, it shifts things. It shifts once whole relationship. I wasn't going to talk about the rooster. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, but I don't know if you've heard, heard last year and over the years there been there was a wild hen chicken that came into the my yard three times, laid six eggs. And, and I got very attached to the eggs and then the chicks and the first two broods died. We're all killed. And then the third, the third brood, six chicks, they, one, two, three, four, five died, and one made it. And it was so exciting. I was so like connected to this chick, like it, it's unbelievable. I just like, and it's turned into a rooster. And it's, it's this kind of deep, unconditional love gets tested a lot. It's not, it's like, because this rooster can be very naughty, like the, the rooster likes to eat the feral cat's food, like, and the, this rooster has gotten very like, you know, determined and knows what time the food goes out. And I just got home and I'm like, this, this rooster has gotten much more vigilant and just much better at it. And just, it's really funny. And then today the goats already came and started eating my garden. And it's like, wow, you know, it's just like, it's great to wake up and go like that, right? And to just have this metta, right, for ourselves and, and unconditional, I mean, unconditional without conditions. And then within seconds, I'm getting tested. 
I didn't, I, I'm not saying I opened the paper yet and saw what was going on, right? It's more just that sense of like, we can get this commitment and then like, it's so funny just how quickly it can shift to being hard. I love the rooster if, if he doesn't eat the cat's food. That's not how it goes. That's not metta. That's an if, right? I love all human beings if there's no war. Not how it works. I love my body if it doesn't get so old that it's too hard. Not how it works. And so, of course, the compassion is so important, the caring about the pain. I thought about asking one of my neighbors if she wanted the rooster, because <laughs> she seems to like chickens. Uh, <laughs> it's my rooster practice now, and it's like caring about pain, right? Because it's not just that he's eating the cat's food. The cats are getting very anxious, right? Like they, they're, they're vigilant enough and they're, they're scared enough, but now it's like the rooster, right? So I watch their anxiety levels up, you know, and it's like, you know, we're all trying to learn to work with the situation. And I'm describing something very easy in comparison to what's often mostly going on for us. So I'm just kind of giving you that sense of like how important it is to establish day after day the unconditional because our training is for things to be so conditional. I love you if, I love myself if, I'll care about, about pain as long as I can get rid of it, right? That's why I said the rooster, it's like, it'd be great to see if the neighbor would want the rooster. It would be less, less, more quiet, right? You know, et cetera. Okay. So um, when we really can appreciate that it can be hard to practice compassion sometimes, but without it, I think nowadays we, we drown. We just drown. And uh, as much as we might try to protect ourselves, it's just like, it's, it's in our face and we, we need to protect ourselves, but also it's just that remembrance that it's about caring about pain and it feels good and it requires um, being committed to it. It, it requires an everyday practice. And then the mudita, of course, for me coming back home and uh, just seeing what plants I've planted are doing okay, and that, that experiencing the beauty of it. And, and also coming from the kind of the late, the very late spring, in British Columbia, <laughs> it's like um, when I get home, one of the things I like to do is to wash my clothes. And I like uh, putting them on the line and watching the wind blow the clothes dry. If I have the time, I love that. Not, I, don't, I don't sit there all day watching them dry, but I like to occasionally stop and look. And, and today, all the clothes on the line were like really, like really for cold weather, right? My long underwear, my, my sweatpants, my, tons of socks, like, you know, the fleece jacket, like it was, and I'm looking at it and going, I'm so grateful. There's such mudita that we even have these things. And it's such mudita that it's warm enough that they dry today, yeah? It's like there's little things that, about the joy that are so important. Again, when, I, when we came down from uh, the island to Vancouver, 
that's like one day. And uh, I, we stopped at this restaurant for lunch. And I've never seen this, but on each table, instead of a flower, there was a, a little glass dish with moss in it. Just a teeny, teeny bit of moss, just the most green, beautiful moss and so soft. And uh, it was just like such mudita, such joy. Meaning we don't need that much to focus on the pleasant. It's all around us. If there's a tree, if there's a picture of a tree, right? It, it's, really, it's really just um, if we can walk, if we can see, right? Like it, it's all around us, this ability to appreciate. But again, it's, it's that commitment to it. And I think what I'm, what I'm really trying to say is that uh, what I'm seeing is that we need to be committed to it more than ever. 2022, easy to drown spiritually if we don't really work harder at it. And then the fourth equanimity, ah, holy equanimity, that ability to have that again, that unconditional, without conditions, acceptance of things as they are, this stream of change pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, the stream of karma or karma unfolding. If you understand we're in a collective karma or karma right now, all of us on the planet, if we accept that, it can help us live through it with great dignity and peace. Hmm. I don't know how fast. In the spring, I love to read uh, Henry David Thoreau's uh, about his journal of wildflowers, uh, mainly because he loved the spring so much. And uh, he loved wildflowers. I love wildflowers. So he, I grew up near where he lived and I have a very strong kindred spirit with his love of wildflowers. So um, we're in May, this is from May 23rd, 1857. I wade in the swamp for the bog laurel amid the water Andromeda and the sphagnum moss, scratching my legs with the first and sink, sinking deep in the last. The water is now gratefully cool to my legs, so far from being poisoned in the strong water of the swamp. It is a sort of baptism for which I have waited a long winter. It's properly called water Andromeda. You must wade into water a or a foot or two deep to find it and get it. I, I love this particular entry in his journal because when he died at age 44, his casket was covered with wildflowers, but inside the casket, a wreath of Andromeda was placed on his heart. It always makes me cry when I think of that, that just such, so connected to the earth and so connected to his love of the flowers, his companions. And I think of like, do we 
really, can we really live in such a way that each day would be like a baptism or each moment, you know, the death and birth of each moment for him, the winter was so long and the, the regeneration of spring was so intense and powerful for him. And, and yet actually with our understanding, each moment can be like that or each day or when we wake up, <laughs> when we wake up or maybe when we get in the shower, Maybe we don't have to find a swamp, right? But when we wash. So longer talk. Our bodies are made up of water. I had learned something very different as a young person, so I looked it up today. It, it's not the same now. The new, the new science <laughs> says that we're 60, well, men are 60% water and women are 55% water. But as you get older, you kind of dry out. I'm one of them. Um, one of my first teachers from Burma, Tangpulu Sayadaw, uh, when I first met him, he said to keep, keep, keep my mind like water, not like a rock, but water. And I think that it's very important when you think of the change that we're living in and how um, it, translating that to the soft readiness of mindfulness, the readiness for anything to happen and the soft readiness. And when we suffer often, the mind has turned hard, right? It resists, it contracts, the mind gets hard. It's not, it's not flowing anymore. And if we look at that, what's, what are we resisting? It's, it's when we're resisting, we're not in harmony with the truth. We're not in harmony with the change that's happening. And that, that in itself, that disconnect from the, the truth is um, why we suffer. We're no longer connected with the truth. So that being connected with impermanence, for example, is a protection. Being disconnected from it and thinking things shouldn't change, we're not protected. We're so disconnected. So when we, when pain arises and we say no, <laughs> no, <laughs> or when the pleasant disappears and we say no, um, that no is the pain. But but what's so important when we hear this is to remember that Vipassana is being with things as they are. It's being with what's predominant. And so to be able to go, ah, oh, ha, 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 resistance, my good friend resistance. Yeah, like it's like that's, that's being water. That's having a mind like water. We're, we're allowing that resistance to happen. It's an unconditional, without conditions, acceptance. It's okay. It's, it's just aversion, right? Aversion to pain or fear of pain or holding on to pleasant or confuse the confusion of delusion. And so much of our practice, so much of the training needs to be just this. Just this. Just learning how to be okay with resistance. Be okay with resistance. Be okay with resistance and not trying to force something that isn't happening. That's being watery, that's being flexible without conditions. And this brings so much trust, more and more trust in ourself and our practice that it's okay that we get <laughs> aversive to pain. I always say, well, of course, aversion is happening right now. 
of course attachment's happening right now. If we can just say, of course, it's okay, then there's a way in which we can bring the mindfulness or the metta, the compassion, the equanimity to that experience. On my um, retreat, I only read <laughs> a few sentences as my teaching for the retreat from Srinazargadatta Maharaj. And the question is, is, is there any such thing as perfection? And Nazargadatta says, Yes, perfection includes all imperfection. And in a world where we tend to be so hard on ourselves and so perfectionistic. But if you look closely, we tend to be trying to perfect experience itself. And what Nizargadatta was pointing to was that we can actually shift, as Steve said in his instruction, turn the awareness on itself. I don't know if you heard that last part, but it's so important. Sometimes turn the awareness upon itself. And Nizargadatta was like, yes, we can actually perfect that. We, we shift from trying to perfect experience, but we, we try to go, oh, I could actually bring compassion to this aversion, right? That's, that's it. You try to bring metta to something, or you try to be mindful, or you see the difference, you try to bring patience to the experience, you don't try to change the experience. That's what we can do. And there's so much possibility in this. It's like so um, rich and so possible. I had a lot more to say, but I think I'll try to. <laughs> Maybe I'll end with this. kind of following that thread that there are often very, very small things that can bring us much mudita. Um, there is a copper colored dragonfly that is a, a dear friend of mine up my street. And I really look forward to seeing it especially when I kept injuring myself the last few years and my world kept shrinking and shrinking and it's not far from my house. Um, so I look forward to going for a little walk in the morning and uh, seeing it. And I think sometimes we don't spend enough time just standing still on a walk, but also with the injury, I learned that I had to stay still a lot. So. I kind of deepened my friendship with this dragonfly when I was injured the last few years because I would stay still. And I started watching its flight patterns. <clears throat> and its flight patterns are very erratic. And I, I would say again, if we didn't watch them long enough, you would see it's not very linear and maybe not a path to follow. <laughs> but when we think about our life, and you know, a path to follow, I would say a dragonfly would be one of the great things to follow. And they aren't 
it doesn't look linear, but actually they really know what they're doing and it's wonderful to watch. And then I really just see that there's a point where it's, it's time for it to just hover in front of me. And those eyes, those huge eyes with all those facets looks at me just for a little while um, and connects. And there's, I think that sense of awe and intimacy and friendship is some, a path for us to follow. They used to be um, considered the guardians of the rice paddies in Japan. But that kind of understanding is starting to fade. So the path we can follow isn't always linear. And when we get more and more quiet and still, I think we can understand our own flight patterns. See our way of maybe circling around that commitment to peace and the commitment to the loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity. as a way of being. Dealing with anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Jennifer or Kay, I'll let you do that part. Great, thank you. It's lovely to see you again. Great to see you. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, I have a question that is about uh, lineage and also about practice. And I'll start with the practice bit. Um, the which isn't the, the question, I'll just share a little bit about my practice and then ask the lineage question. So my practice is, you know, I'm very dedicated to it. It's the first, my meditation practice, first thing I do in the morning. Um, and for a while it's felt sort of, I don't know, it, it, is, a, um, it is a restful and um, a, I don't know, a place that I trust. And I feel like I haven't, um, but it also feels sort of like a plateau. Um, and we've talked before about concentration. I have a lot of awareness, but a lot of a lot, not a lot of concentration. And so I was talking with another friend who sat a retreat in a, I think it's a different lineage of Burmese Buddhism. So I'm curious if uh, what it, and he, the lineage through Pa Ak, which I think there might be more, more emphasis on concentration and the jhanas. And so I, I was just curious um, if you could talk a little bit about concentration on the jhanas in this particular lineage and maybe a little bit about the relationship between these two as I'm curious if I should be bringing more concentration into my practice as sort of a, to give it a little more juice. Thank you. Steve, do you wanna start? I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We missed the first part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, previously, have you tried, have you brought more concentration in? Do you know what that, when you talk about needing or wanting more concentration to balance your practice, does it come from experience? Um, concentration has felt um, difficult for me. 
So I have a lot of awareness, but it is not easy for me to develop concentration. Um, and I have received advice, you know, from this set of teachers that that's, that's fine. That's great. Don't worry about it. Um, sort of not, that's not the emphasis, I guess. So I have well, how, it, trying to cultivate it really. So yeah. how would you describe your <clears throat> awareness? You say awareness, you have no problem with that. It's easy. So, but describe what it does. Um, it, it is very busy. It moves around a lot. Um, from the so beginning, make contact from following with, your breath. Yeah, make contact with the breath, stay with the breath. You know, maybe a, a, in, in a regular sitting that's not during a retreat, like one or two breaths and then it's off, you know, and then bring it back, you know, that's just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if nobody had said anything to you, would you feel fine about your practice? <laughs> well, I, I have had this feeling of plateau for a while, you know, it's right. just, you know, it's, um, and I, I also know that I have a judgmental mind, so it's not surprising that there would be, uh, you know, what, yeah, maybe I should be doing something different, you know, but, right. uh, uh, but there, but I also think, um, like there's been a lot of comfort and stability and sort of safety in my practice, but I would say there hasn't been a lot of kind of dynamism or insight recently. Yeah, you also mentioned trust. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I like that. I don't know that I would suggest much more. You, you, there's little things you can do just to um, see what it feels like, like to stay with your breath a little longer and between breaths, like between out breath and out, uh, in breath to focus on your hands touching. If your hands are touching each other or if they're touching your, you know, legs, left hand, right hand, one after the other. So rising, falling, touching. So that means there's no space for the mind to go off as easily. In that gap where it usually goes off between the falling and the rising, you, you have a meditation focus. The touch point it can be your hands, it can be your sit point, your sit, your sit bones. It can be other points like your feet too. And you can move around to make it interesting so you don't get bored of that rising, falling, touching hands, rising, falling, touching left foot, rising, falling, touching right foot. And just see if you can get a rhythm going with that. That'll certainly make you more concentrated. I'm not sure there was anything wrong with your mindfulness. As it was, as it is. <laughs> That's what I would- Except for the plateau. I mean, I'd ask you more questions about that. You want to say something, Michelle? Only that I agree with you and that um, one of the things that I feel like Deepama taught me, where did you, she go, Jennifer? Is she um, gone? She, she, she turned into Molly. I don't like Molly, but I'm, I'm going to keep with her. I, Jennifer, did Jennifer. she go to another page? Yes, she's she, on the second page. Okay, hi, Jennifer. Okay, okay good. Um, one of the, a simple thing that I think is really helpful, but very few people want to do it, is Deepama always said to me um, to walk, to do some slow walking before sitting every morning. And it really helps. And it, it because like the idea of the walking, the idea of concentration is only that you're taking momentary segments and and shortening it so that you're building the concentration within this very small place and time. So so with a, a step, you're trying to synchronize the attention. We talk, we char, you connect and sustain through the lifting, you connect and sustain through the moving and the placing. 
and if you if you really really honestly the the resistance that people have to this is enormous but it actually helps your daily sitting practice because it brings energy it brings concentration so that when you do go to sit down to be with the movement of the breath or connect sustain with a sound or with anything you have that 10 or 15 minutes where you're connect, move, lifting, moving, placing. You're not even trying to be that mindful. You're trying to develop the concentration with that. Do you, do you see? That and for daily practice, I think it's brilliant. And I think she was very smart. Uh, she's probably the most concentrated person I've ever met. So, But I think that that idea that where we're trying to reassure you and certainly what Steve says, I think is correct. Um, what I see with that kind of de over, that development of concentration, there's often a lot of identification with it and it can feel good, but then you're back to moment to moment experience, right? Like it's like you can develop it, but there's a level to where developing the concentration with the mindfulness is meant to feed the insight um, and I think you're just needing a teeny boost. It could be metta instead of what I'm saying. It could be just doing 10 or 15 minutes of metta, or, you know, as a concentration. And, and so maybe while walking. Yeah. yeah, walking. Before you sit. Yeah. Try it, because I think, again, it usually is very helpful, but... <laughs> For some reason, people don't like this instruction. <laughs> yeah, Let us know next week. Resistance to walking, but uh, <laughs> what minutes. about what about to the Brahma Viharas? Yeah, metta sounds well. No, I mean maybe maybe it is the time to turn to the things that are a little bit challenging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I that would be good too. Yeah. Try it. What did you say, Steve, at the last retreat? Two weeks? At the, the last retreat? Oh, oh yeah. Utundra. Uh, Utundra. Yeah, in Burma, uh, I, I was given a, a healthy <laughs> challenge. Try it for two weeks. If I don't like it, I can give it up forever. Mm. So I just did two weeks of daily practice that included walking. And, and he knew that by the end of the two weeks, I'd appreciate it for two things. One for energy and two for concentration. And actually three for the combination of those two. Yeah. yeah. I mean, another angle is usually getting interested in things ending. <laughs> And that, like, that's also, that brings insight where you'd be interested in sounds ending or interested in body sensations ending, and that takes energy. So a lot of that walking instruction or Brahma Vihara instruction is to boost energy so that there's some, uh, that we stand a chance to get interested in noticing the moment to moment endings. Great. Thank you. Yeah. 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 It's a good, did you have a second question? Well, I mean, I am curious about kind of these different lineages and, and how some seem to be centering concentration more, but that's something that I can also uh, study up on my own. It's a fascinating subject. Yeah. Steve, yeah. do you want to address that or not? In this tradition too. If, if you, <laughs> yeah, if you sat a long enough retreat and and had the traditional instruction that we got you, you would get that degree of concentration so come to a longer retreat of ours and we'll give we'll give you a lot of concentration great <laughs> <laughs> yeah some and people are... are inclined to it and then if they're inclined to it we, we tend to 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 feed that because it it gets them more into the practice you know, it, it, they, they cement themselves more into the practice forever. Other people aren't as inclined. And, and so by something like you have a lot of faith, you said you had a lot of trust in the practice, that's good to develop. 
And actually that leads to concentration if you just follow that mindfulness and concentration together. So we tend to look for what's already strong in, in a yogi like yourself and then feed that, nurture that. Wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Um, so great to have you both back. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking a lot about uncontrollability. And I just recently said to someone, whenever our teachers say there's not that much you can control, some part of me thinks, really? And then I feel this great relief, um, and, you know, like my body opens. And um, I don't know if that's true for most people, but I, it just comes as a surprise to me each time. And um, with what you were saying about how we're not taught about this and we need to have compassion, I was thinking that our parents probably don't teach us this because they are trying to protect us from that that it's such a hard truth. And so they say, you can be anything you want to be when clearly you can't be anything you want to be. Um, I couldn't be an Olympic figure skater. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> so that's what I've been thinking about, but I think that's helpful to think about. Um, for me, it's helpful to think about it as a protection rather than um, rather than something that they should have done. I mean, they would have been great, but um, I think um, what we're taught when you're, we're young is often many layered in why it's the way it is. I think. Um, it comes down to what a culture values, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's probably a lot of people who are not taught they can be any, I mean. True, that's what, yeah, it's, that's what I meant. It's very layered and complex. Um, yeah, past and race. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that's complicated. Um, I think that um, the idea that we can feel more protected by being connected with Anicca Dukkha Anatta rather than trying to get, you know, get rid of it or to avoid it or to fix it or to manipulate it, that whole sense of just being with it as it is, that as it isness of it versus the um, all the ways that in each, you know, the aversion, attachment, delusion in the face of it. I think that that gradual shift to realizing that um, we're not surprised if it's uncontrollable, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's huge. And yet I still am. <laughs> At times. <laughs> yeah, at times. I mean, it's, you'd be fully enlightened if you weren't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh. It's great. It's a, it's that relief is so that whole, f I think the way we offer the teaching this, you know, that whole feeling of the whole body relaxing with the, with the insight is really important. Mm -hmm. It's huge. I, I couldn't say enough about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Steve, okay. you have a word for the relaxa relaxation of... We wake up. We wake up means re relaxation or rest or seclusion or solitude. We wake up. Can you spell that? You... Sorry, Molly. Can you spell that? Uh, v, V pronounced with a W. A w yeah. I, V again. 
E K A. We wake up. We wake up. Mostly when we talk about uncontrollability, it's it's the it's the third of the three um, characteristics. So anicca, um, dukkha, anatta. Anatta itself means uh, uncontrollability. It also means selflessness. But the uncontrollability means we we also can't control anicca. We can't stop the stream of change and we can't control dukkha with a command be sukha be happy not dukkha um, but understanding these truths gives us a an energy and a and a uh, a confidence that we we can influence experience you know we understand that because things are changing, um, there's there's dukkha because there's nothing to hold on to. There's no stability. It's, it's all unstable and all in flux. And, and because of that, where, where can there be a self that does stop it or change it, you know, or make it reliable? Uh, but the influence part is like when we in, infuse wisdom into our practice, into our lives, or any of the Brahma Viharas, uh, it, it doesn't mean it's immediately going to change it, but the potential is there. And if we keep it up as a practice, if we continually practice, you know, generosity, loving kindness, compassion, it does begin to have an influence on our thoughts, our speech, our action and the energy field that grows around us. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. so, if, so if you don't think in terms of a objectified me and you and I and they, them and so forth, but a process, if you think in terms of process, infuse our relationship with things and other people and life as it is with these powerful, skillful, um, um, potentially earth shifting qualities like the Brahma Viharas and certainly wisdom and then let go of any attachment to result then it's still selfless we're still infusing wisdom as we know it at that moment and, and by letting go of expectation or results we'll find out if it's true or not And most most of us have found out, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> if I put Brahma Viharas or wisdom into my life, in some way it has an immediate effect on my mental moods and, and it comes back. And the people I'm, I, I'm attracted to or the things in life I'm attracted to, it puts me in those beautiful places or with beautiful people. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to raise your hand, Quinn? I think Tang, maybe. Not sure. I have this question for. I don't see any. It's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have this question for Steve. Go ahead. Uh, because uh, we live uh, maybe practically same neighborhood. I have a feeling when I meditate, the bird come, the bird, the, the bird come, the, they come, and they sing with yeah. me when I meditate. 
<laughs> I don't know whether Steve has the same experience because we live close by uh, and the World Cup. And sometimes uh, my wife will say uh, there are new type of birds never seen before. They, they sing very, uh, very clear, very, uh, very nice. Every once in a while, there's a bird like that called the Hawaiian yeah. Shama that flies down from the Ko'olau Mountains above us, oh. those green, oh, really? tall mountains. Yeah, it, maybe once or once a month or every once every month or two. That's very yeah, sweet, very, very high, and then cascading sounds that kind of trickle down like drops of water. I think I know the bird you mean, and it. It seems to happen when I meditate too. So maybe we're hearing the same bird. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder whether they say the telepathy between me and the bird. They come <laughs> when I meditate and they uh, add it to uh, my meditation. That's good, Tang. I, so I think the message is let's meditate more. Oh, I see. <laughs> it's one of the most beautiful bird sounds yeah. i think there is it's it's incredible we don't have them on this island there's no shama thrushes oh, on this island. just on oahu shama, shama thrush yeah shama. we're lucky yeah very lucky thank you thank you thank a nice yeah, observation. Yeah. <laughs> they bring happiness, those birds. They do. They're, they're happy <laughs> birds. I think they're, yeah, happy, they're birds. happy birds. Well, I have a rooster, so I have a different sound. <laughs> of course, Oahu has their share of roosters as well, so. They're everywhere. <laughs> For those of you who don't live in Hawaii, that there are many, many, many roosters and chickens and chicks. It's like they're everywhere. And one time I had a friend who came over from Oahu to where I live from Honolulu. They live in a valley where there are many, many, many roosters in Palolo Valley. And um, I said, you might want to, you know, shut your window tonight because I don't think you're going to be able to sleep. And he, he was just so um, kind of almost insulted that I would infer that he he couldn't handle the sound near my house, around my house. And and I said, it's okay, okay. I know you live in Palolo, but I said the neighbors have a lot of roosters. It's like most people who stay here complain. And I said, I'm just letting you know that, you know, you can keep the door of your bedroom open and I'm upstairs and it's good. Just do what you want. And the next morning he had big bags under his eyes. <laughs> he said, I can't believe you have many more roosters than Paloa Valley. And I said, well, we do. They're in the backyard up the hill. <laughs> it's just so funny. So um, it is a lucky thing that if you're in Oahu, you also have the shama brushes. You have joy and sorrow, <laughs> pleasure and pain, equanimity. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
nice to feel. It's nice to feel being together in the, and being quiet. It's a rare, rare and beautiful. Sean had a question. Yeah, actually it's about the sound. You don't have cookie frog? Well, not yet. <laughs> it's one of the last places in the Big Island because it's so dry. I'm not sure they'll, they could survive here, but they're close. I've heard them very close, but not, not right here. But I, I don't know if they'll, they can survive in, the, in this level of, plus the drought is so bad, but I'll find out they're coming closer and closer. Are they in Oahu? I don't think so. No, I don't no. think so. Yeah, I think I, I heard them last time we went to the big island. Or... Well, oh, there's plenty, plenty. Puerto Rico. Yeah, we went where's, to where's, where's Puerto Mark? Rico. Uh -huh. But Mark, is Mark still here? Over on the volcano side, the uh, Hilo side, there's, it's really yeah. intense, yeah. Right. And then they're right there, I would say five, six miles from me there around. No, Mark isn't here. Harry knows. Harry's been over Hilo. You know about the cookie frog. <laughs> They're another issue. <laughs> They're just hearing. It's just hearing, but it's. Oh, Mark's gone. Yeah, no, not here. Coming soon. I hope I hear... not. Please don't oh, it's say okay. that. What? Please don't say that. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. They're down at uh, Mauna Kea. That's not far. If they come, it'll be just part of the soundscape. So oh, it seems like uh, we might be pow finished. Any parting words, Stephen? Thank you for your practice. Sorry. Good yeah. questions. A little is a lot, so just some of your little concerns answers a whole lot of concerns for everyone. So appreciate when you put it out there, courageous energy. May we be safe and protected, happy and peaceful, strong and healthy. Take care of ourselves happily. Have a good week. <laughs> Thank you.